be lovely to be here. It's been 10 years since I've been to Kansas City. I wish I had more time to explore this great city. Um, so I'm going to give you an update on trends in the organic seed trade as well as some of the policy discussions underway that affect you as growers, um, again, in the context of organic seed. But first, I just want to give you a brief overview of our work at Organic Seed Alliance. How many people in the room are familiar with OSA? Okay, so quite a few. That's great. We are a nonprofit that works nationally to essentially ensure that Organic farmers have the seed they need to be successful. We're based in Port Towns in Washington um, with offices in Missoula, Montana, where I am, as well as Madison, Wisconsin, and Arcata, California. First and foremost, we are largely a research and education organization. We conduct professional plant breeding hand in hand with organic farmers and public plant breeders at a number of universities across the country with the goals of identifying existing varieties in the marketplace that do especially well in organic and other low input production systems. And we also breed new varieties that are adapted to organic conditions to help uh, fill the supply gaps that we know exist in the organic seed trade. We also have a pretty robust education program where we teach farmers how to grow seed organically, especially at a commercial scale so that growers who are interested in, in growing under contract for a number of the organic seed companies around the country, they have the opportunity to do that, either to build the supply on their own farm or to help fill supply gaps, as I men just mentioned, um, and to diversify their income stream as well. We also teach organic farmers how to conduct on-farm plant breeding, and we have a number of resources that are free for you all on our website at seedalliance.org if you are interested in learning more how to grow seed on your farm or to conduct your own crop improvement pr um, projects. And then our advocacy program, of which I direct, focuses on promoting actions and policies that support organic seed systems. So in other words, the systems, seed systems that are responsive to the diverse and regional needs of organic growers, regardless of scale, regardless of crop, regardless of region. And some of the policy areas that we focus on include uh, supporting farmers' ability to meet the organic seed requirement and supporting certifiers and inspectors in um, enforcing that requirement in a reasonable and measurable way. We also work on the issue of where agricultural biotechnology, where genetically engineered crops and excluded method interface with organic seed. So we're often providing recommendations to the USDA on how we can level the playing field with stronger regulations for genetically engineered crops. And we also provide recommendations on appropriate intellectual property protections. So we feel strongly that intellectual property protections on seed have become increasingly restrictive and applied in ways that we would call unethical, ways that restrict farmers' ability to save seed, ways that restrict research from going on, including in the public sector. So we also provide recommendations on what fair and reasonable intellectual property rights protections look like. And finally, we weigh in on issues pertaining to consolidation and market power in the seed industry as well, as, especially as that pertains to farmers, including organic farmers' access to diverse seed options in the marketplace. Now, I'm mostly going to talk about our state of organic seed project today. Um, but first, I just want to set the stage with our long-term vision, which is we do envision long-term an organic food supply that is built on a foundation of organic seed. We all know that when the federal program was implemented in 2002, there was hardly any certified organic seed available. The organic seed trade was in its infancy. And in important ways, it's still in its infancy. But we have made tremendous progress in building the organic seed supply. Now we have a ways to go to fully meet, as I mentioned before, all the diverse and regional needs of organic operations in the US. But this progress is certainly worth noting. And our State of Organic Seed Project, which I'll talk about here in a minute, measures the progress we're making in meeting the organic seed needs of farmers across the US. Now, we believe organic seed is important to the integrity of organic production systems and we want to help growers meet a regulatory requirement, but we believe even more important than helping growers meet a regulatory requirement is the fact that fostering the development of organic seed systems, so healthy seed systems from breeding to production to distribution, 
that are truly responsive to the needs of organic growers has long-term benefits for agriculture as a whole. Seed, we know as a natural living organism, holds endless potential for transforming how we farm and what we eat. And so we're very committed to uh, supporting organic seed systems uh, based on the values and principles that help to found the organic movement, the principles of ecological diversity, biological diversity, health, care, and fairness. And we believe that the organic community has an opportunity to create a much different path for organic seed that's distinct from the current dominant system where a handful of chemical and biotechnology firms control much of the seed supply, especially when it comes to major crops. And we know we're also facing three pending seed industry mergers that further threaten to consolidate and privatize our plant genetic resource base. So the work to support organic seed systems, in our opinion, is more important than ever. So how are we doing? We published our first five-year update to, this, to our State of Organic Seed report in 2016, which allowed us for the first time to measure the progress we're making in um, supporting farmers' access to organic seed. Now, the goal of this project, again, is to monitor the status of organic seed systems and, again, to measure how we're doing in increasing the diversity, quality, and genetic integrity of organic seed available to growers here in the United States. We do this by collecting a lot of data, a lot of data. <laughs> we conduct uh, a survey of organic crop growers across the US. Maybe some of you in this room took it. I hope you did. Um, every five years, we conduct this survey. And it, get, it allows us to understand farmers' perspectives of organic seed, uh, supply gaps, what farmers believe plant breeding priorities should be for organic agriculture, perspectives on genetically modified organisms, it goes in, on and on. So we conduct a farmer survey. We also conduct a survey of certifiers to better understand their perspective on the organic seed requirement and issues they have in consistently enforcing it. And understanding, importantly, the status of organic seed availability, which we know is always changing and hard to keep track of, especially by crop type and by region. We also conduct a survey of organic seed companies to understand their production challenges. And then we hosted listening sessions across the US um, to hear from other organic stakeholders who weren't targeted by the surveys that I met, just mentioned. Today, I'm only gonna give you a snapshot of some of our findings to give you a picture of, of the progress we are making in, in organic seed. This report can be downloaded on our website at seedalliance.org. It's more than 100 pages. It provides over 35 recommendations that serve as a blueprint, not just for us as an organization, but for the broader organic community, because it really does take diverse stakeholders along the entire production chain to support, again, the development of organic seed systems from growers to seed companies to certifiers to even buyers and, and manufacturers. So how are we doing? First, we found, um, that more organic farmers are indeed sourcing more organic seed compared to the first survey we conducted and published in 2011. So again, the data today um, demonstrates uh, progress we've made over the last five years based on a report that was published in 2016. We found that across crop types, 27% um, of organic growers reported that they're already using 100% organic seed and more than 30% of the organic growers responding to our survey say that they've increased their organic seed usage over the last three years. This demonstrated a minor improvement uh, compared to our first report. We also found that farmers are gen generally more satisfied with the quality of the organic seed they're using. 75, about 75% of growers reported that they have the same quality issues with certified organic seed as they do with untreated conventional seed. And again, this demonstrated improvement compared to our first round of data. An encouraging finding is that farmers also uh, reported that they increasingly understand the benefits of organic seed. So beyond being a regulatory requirement, 85% of organic farmers responding to our survey agreed that organic plant breeding seed developed in the environment of their int intended use was important to their success as an organic grower, as well as to the long-term success of the organic industry. And this, this was a big change, actually, a relatively big change from our first report. 
um, again, in terms of farmers um, communicating that there were benefits of using organic seed and choosing organic seed as a way to invest in the organic seed supply and organic plant breeding efforts, um, benefits to that to their own success. This is a picture of a participatory plant breeding project actually in my neck of the woods in Montana. That's a collaboration of a number of Montana um, organic sweet corn breeders, believe it or not, um, with University of Wisconsin-Madison breeder Bill Tracy visiting and Jim Myers from Oregon State University. This was another very encouraging finding that organic seed investments in the way of research are on the rise. So when our first report was published in 2011, we documented a mere $9 million being invested in organic plant breeding and other organic seed research type projects. And that was, between, that was documented between 1996 and 2009. In our last report, we documented $22 million over a five-year period being invested in these types of projects. A lot of this funding is coming from USDA programs such as the Organic Research and Extension Initiative, OREI projects, SARE grants, um, a number of other federal programs, as well as some um, private foundations such as the Organic Farming Research Foundation and um, Cliff Bar Family Foundation as well has invested over a million dollars over the last five years in organic, organic plant breeding research. Now, our report again gets into the weeds, into a lot of data that breaks down these investments by region, by crop type, by research priority. I can tell you that the Midwest ranked third in the amount of um, money going toward these, this type of research. More than $4 million has been invested in a number of crops for Midwest organic growers. Uh, and I should also say that the vast majority of this funding, more than 80% of the funding that you see here on the chart, went toward organic plant breeding and variety trials specifically, as opposed to other organic seed research, such as understanding pest control issues and producing organic seed and, and other research um, focused on seed production specifically. And I think this emphasis, um, or the fact that a lot of these dollars went toward breeding projects and variety trials really underscores both the need as well as the interest, especially among public land-grant universities, in, again, breeding crops in and for these lower input production systems. And we know that organic plant breeding and other organic seed research doesn't just benefit organic growers, it also benefits growers who aren't growing organically and who aren't certified. Um, the opposite can always be true for investments made toward research that's being conducted in more conventional chemical intensive production systems that too often the research results aren't benefiting organic growers. Are there any questions that? And perhaps this goes without saying for this crowd, but we often get asked the question, well, who, well, who cares about organic seed? Why is organic plant breeding different? And of course, as I more or less just uh, mentioned, organic production systems are very different from other production systems and therefore require different attention when it comes to breeding and research efforts. Organic plant breeders and organic seed producers are working for you as organic growers. They're focusing on traits for lower input production systems such as disease resistance, quick emergence, weed um, competition. Uh, nutrient use efficiency, and these characteristics are of course also important to non-organic growers, but they're going to be prioritized differently in organic plant breeding projects, such as a quick emergence, uh, a trait in a particular crop might be more important for an organic plant breeding project where those growers can't rely on other tools, especially chemical tools, to address weed and pest production challenges. Of course, there were areas in our data, in our findings, where we saw little or no progress. If you remember the chart I showed early on about how many organic growers reported using organic seed, 27% say they're, using, they're already using 100% organic seed. Well, of course, that means that more than two-thirds of growers, organic growers, to some extent, are relying on untreated conventional seed. So again, we still have a ways to go to, to support a robust seed supply and support growers in finding the seed that works um, optimally in their production system. 
while we saw an increase in organic seed usage across crop types by acreage, we did see a decrease in forage acreage, um, in overall forage acreage in the U.S. planted to organic seed. We also found that the largest organic operations are still using relatively little organic seed, and perhaps this comes as no surprise since the quantity of a particular organic seed variety can often be a problem, as well as uh, um, large operations at times are growing under a contract with a buyer that dictates a specific organic variety be grown. Uh, perhaps that variety isn't available in an organic form or again in the quantity they need, or perhaps a buyer is even directly sourcing, excuse me, <coughs> uh, seed for their growers. Nonetheless, we found, this is um, vegetable acreage. Um, there might not be a lot of vegetable growers in the room, but we see that with 10% uh, or fewer acres that growers are using about seven, are planting organic seed on about 75% of their acreage. As we increase acreage, we see that amount of organic seed go down. By the time we get to 480 acres or more, those growers on average are only um, planting about 20% or less of their acreage to organic seed. Now this of course is a challenge, especially in the context of contracts, as I just mentioned, but it is also an opportunity, and the organic community is really good at creating and closing feedback loops, in my opinion, and there's an opportunity to have more conversation with the, especially when it comes to contracts, um, to sit down with organic seed production companies and buyers of the end product and the certified organic growers to identify what the genetic needs are and to plan well ahead um, in terms of seed production so that organic growers have the varieties they need to be successful, ensuring, of course, that those varieties do well on their farm, but also to meet um, specific contract requirements. We also found uh, that 40% of organic growers responding to our survey reported that their certifier had encouraged them to take extra measures to source more organic seed. Maybe these were operations that weren't demonstrating enough improvement over the years. Um, but this, this finding um, showed a, a marked decrease from our first report where 60% of growers responding to our survey communicated that their certifier had encouraged them to say, go beyond three seed sources or to try a uh, planting a variety trial to see if there was an organic variety that perf performed as well, if not better, than one of their standard conventional varieties. Uh, so again, there was a, a, a flip in terms of the percentage of growers saying that their certifiers were encouraging them to use more organic seed. And this is important because our data also shows that for those growers who communicated that they were encouraged to take extra measures, they indeed responded accordingly and, and sourced more organic seed. At the end of the day, it is not our intent or anyone's intent in the organic community to force organic farmers to use seed that isn't appropriate for your farm. We would never promote actions or policies that would lead to that kind of pressure or result. At the same time, this underscores the important role that certifiers and inspectors play in, again, supporting the development of organic seed systems more broadly. And so this is a good segue into, um, actually I'm gonna skip that one really quick, um, just sharing a bit about what's going on in discussions within the National Organic Standards Board and at the National Organic Program level. How many people in the room have actually been to an NOSB meeting to provide comments? Or provided written comments, perhaps? Good. Um, well, organic seed has been on their agenda for a couple of years now. And they have, the NOSB has developed language to strengthen a 2013 guidance document to provide more clarity to certifiers and inspectors when it comes to understanding commercial availability of organic seed and how to enforce the requirement in a reasonable and measurable way. So this, this proposal of the NOSB will be in front of uh, the board again this spring in April in Tucson, Arizona. The comment period will be opening up probably within a month or so. Uh, and I encourage you, if you're interested in providing comments, to do so. I actually, um, I might have misplaced it. I put together a sheet where you can 
sign up with your email address, um, and I will make sure that you get into our system to receive those NOSB policy alerts specific to SEED. Um, maybe I'll leave that up here after my talk, and if you're interested, you can come and sign up. But the NOSB is also discussing language, adding language to the requirement that essentially would, uh, uh, again, communicate that organic operations should demonstrate improvement year to year in sourcing organic seed. And it, and it just says that it leaves a ton of flexibility up to certifiers to determine how best to measure that progress. And, I'm hap and it's, it's part of an ongoing conversation. I'm happy to answer more questions about that. But those are the key uh, pieces that are in front of the NOSB this spring regarding the organic seed requirement. There's language in that uh, proposal for updating the, uh, excuse me, the guidance document for certifiers that just provides recommendations in the way of encouraging growers to go beyond three sources, to communicate to handlers who are dictating a certain variety be grown, um, that organic seed is a requirement of you as a certified producer, among other um, recommendations. The NOSB is also discussing two additional seed-related topics. For years now, for at least five years, the NOSP is discussing what, if any, role they can play in supporting the protection of the genetic integrity of organic seed and other seed used in organic production systems in the face of GMOs, seeing that genetic engineering is an excluded method. So they've, um, they've published a uh, discussion document that essentially serves as best practices for trying to prevent the problem to begin with, but they're closely monitoring how they can support the organic community, support organic producers um, to ensure that uh, they have access to seed that doesn't include these, that wasn't developed with excluded methods. And on that point, they're also discussing how to determine which methods, especially more modern breeding techniques, should or shouldn't be excluded from organic systems. We know that development in plant breeding um, beyond genetic engineering are rapidly evolving, much quicker actually than our regulations. And they have also evolved past, in a way, the excluded um, methods definition. And so last year, the NOSB passed a proposal that is established a framework for helping the board moving forward evaluate existing and new methods to determine if they should be excluded, such as gene editing and uh, cell fusion and all these other methods that, have, um, that are either in use already or are just now being used in the development of seed. And this framework includes principles and criteria that the organic community weighed in on to ensure that they reflect Again, the founding values and principles of the organic movement. And it also includes a table of methods. Um, and then lists next to these methods whether they are excluded or not, so that there's much more clarity, not just for organic growers and other members of the organic community, but also for plant breeders and seed companies, so they understand what is and what isn't allowed in the organic seed supply. And so this is an ongoing effort, an ongoing, you can call it a living document, really, of the NOSB that we'll continue to see at each meeting as, we, um, as the board aims to get more input about breeding methods and to clarify which ones are excluded. So I mentioned that the next meeting is in a April 25th to 27th in Tucson. Um, and with that, I'll open it up for questions. I'll, Mentioned that Organic Seed Finder is a, an online tool for finding organic seed. Um, if you're interested, if you're an organic seed head, if you will, <laughs> I invite you to our biennial Organic Seed Growers Conference. The next one is actually in a few weeks. Um, it's typically held in the Pacific Northwest in Corvallis, Oregon. It's the largest uh, gathering of the organic seed community in North America, bringing together a number of seed producers, public plant breeders working in the area of organic seed, a lot of um, private seed companies, other researchers, farmers, and policy advocates like myself. So I encourage you to check it out. You can also download the proceedings after the event and still benefit um, from the speakers there. We also host, I think we'll be hosting six live stream webinars from the conference. So if, if you're not interested in attending or can't attend, um, check out how to sign on to these e-organic webinars 
uh, where we'll be featuring, like I said, six sessions live from the conference. They'll also be archived after the event as well. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, Demetria. We, we didn't ask questions that got down to that level of detail. My understanding is that still everyone is enforcing the requirement differently. So some are asking questions or evaluating whether those seed sources actually sell organic seed or not, whereas others might not be. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I forgot to mention a project that I promised Angie I would talk about, which is Organic Seed Alliance is in the preliminary stages of working very closely with certifiers and developing a manual focused on organic seed. And the, the audience um, is certifiers and inspectors. And we're working closely with certifiers to essentially call these best practices so that there is more consistency and that there is more understanding of how to understand availability issues and other resources available and how to also measure improvement, um, especially if uh, that guidance and update to the organic seed requirement moves forward. So we're really excited to be partnering on this project so that we can just, again, support the certification community and by extension, organic growers, so that we can make more measurable and reasonable progress and that there's more clarity um, and access of, about the requirement and, um, and more consistent enforcement. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the biggest barriers to more growers engaging in seed work, whether it's seed production on their farm or breeding projects, right? Is that your question? And even selling uh, farm developed varieties. Uh, well, clearly this takes a different skill set to grow seed versus an, an edible crop or grain crop. And so, you know, just time for those trainings and whether you're self-taught or going to training so that you know how to conduct that type of seed production or breeding projects. Um, so it's a whole different skill set. And it, but it, for growers who get into it, it's really exciting and potentially even lucrative if they're successful at it, especially when it comes to contracts. But I think um, skill sets, you know, understanding market needs and um, how to enter the organic seed marketplace. Um, we get so, we field a lot of questions from seed growers about understanding contracts and do I have a ne negotiating rights with an organic seed company? And you know, how do I know which crops are gonna yield well as a seed crop? And so we, we actually have a number of projects underway right now focused on the economics of organic seed production, including um, in Montana, Washington, and in the Midwest too, we have one through a risk management agency grant that I'd be happy to talk about too. And so that kind of data also supports um, entering into these types of projects and the success of seed growers. Does that, yeah. Oh yeah, there is so much interest among land-grant universities in organic research generally, but also breeding and cultivar development specifically. And I'd be happy to list them off. I'll give you a couple of project examples. Our research team at Organic Seed Alliance were involved in a participatory plant breeding pro project called the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. It includes Cornell University, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Oregon State University, Washington State University, and ourselves in Washington State. 
and it focuses by region on developing and adapting, again, new vegetable varieties for organic systems, coupled with training organic growers both in that breeding project, because farmers are key partners in all of this research. They're helping to determine uh, project goals, which traits to select for, and at times, we've even released a couple of varieties and are able to return small royalties back to farmer partners, which is really exciting and establishing an encouraging model of returns on investment because we're not against intellectual property rights per se, but we're against overly restrictive intellectual property rights. And so it comes down to what that, um, if, like what that ownership looks like and how they're enforced. Um, but those are a few universities, the ones I just mentioned, that have meaningful programs um, in organic plant breeding and other organic seed research. What's encouraging is that we know that university breeding programs are training the next generation of breeders. Sadly, we've lost about 30% of our public plant breeding programs across the country, which I see as a crisis, especially in the context of consolidation in the private trade, which can't and will never fully address all of our seed needs, especially underserved crops that aren't very lucrative to them or uh, you know, marginal regions and that have very unique um, specific climate, soil, and environmental con conditions. And so we need, this. I'm going a little bit off tangent, one of our policy priorities too is to advocate strongly for federal research dollars to fund public plant breeding programs, regardless if that's focused on organic or not, because we need more public cultivar development, that programs that are responding specifically to the regional needs of growers. Um, the next, what, what I see in my work and in the organic seed community are so many passionate uh, graduate students, especially in public breeding programs across the country, especially at the universities I just listed off, and there are other universities too. Um, Purdue University, um, North Dakota State University has some students. And these grad students are really passionate about organic research and want to have a place either when they're finished with school, either in the private organic seed world or in the public breeding sector. And so the interests of, of younger generations is also driving the momentum and funding for these public programs. And I find that incredibly hopeful. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah, so with the decline of funding and support for our public plant breeding programs, that's what's led to this 30% I mentioned. And too often when a, one of those breeders retires or is let go of, they're not refilling these positions, which is a terrifying trend. As public funding has gone down for public research programs, private investments have surged. And I don't think private investments in university research is something to criticize on its own, especially in the face of decreased public sources. However, at times, that research, those research dollars are coming with strings attached or agendas, um, or it's privatizing, commodifying that, um, those research results. Sometimes uni uh, uni uh, privately funded university research those um, corporations funding the research will make the university sign agreements that say you can't publish findings from this research until we re review it, or you can't compare our variety to this other competitor's variety. And farmers need, we, we all need performance data. We need to know how varieties perform, which is why variety trials and the work of extension agents and other nonprofits is so important so that we have data, reliable data to share. Um, especially under organic conditions, variety trials conducted under uh, organic conditions. So I can give you more of the history of why we've, we've seen that surge in private investments, but I'll just stop there. But there are, there are a lot of good public breeders out there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all of the, I, I think, I'm not going to say most, but a lot of the Organ the organic research programs that are related to breeding are funding open pollinated projects. 
Um, all the projects that we're involved in, we're involved in four different OREI participatory plant breeding projects that span the country. All of those varieties are open pollinated. We, re we co-released an open uh, the first organically bred open pollinated sweet corn in collaboration with Wisconsin a couple of years ago as one example. Um, and this is a variety that uh, germinates better than others in cold, wet soils, and a trait, of course, important to organic growers because we can't rely on fungicide treatments. Um, but yes, absolutely, there's a huge emphasis and demand for open pollinated. There's still also, of course, a demand, rightfully so, for hybrids, and we actually are doing more education around how seed growers can produce hybrid organic seed. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you again for having me.